Hello, everyone, and welcome to Money Matters with Shannon Jackson, a personal finance show focused on moving you forward financially. When you think about money, how does it make you feel? Why do you think you feel this way? That one word, money, is linked to so many reactions and emotions, and those reactions actually influence our decisions when it comes to our financial matters, and usually we don't even realize it. And this is financial psychology. And that's the focus of our discussion today. Joining me is an expert on the subject. He is a certified financial planner, certified financial behavior specialist, finance writer whose regular column, A Rich Life, can be found at Money Sense. And he's also the host of the most hated F word podcast. Sean Maslick, welcome to Money Matters. Thank you so much for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Now, before we get into our discussion, can you talk a little bit about your background, particularly your role as a certified financial behavior specialist? Yeah, you know, I had no idea that designation existed when I entered the personal finance space. I, I really joined as a because I aspired to have a career that's going to help people with their money. Uh, drawn out of the interest that I had with money as I went to university, I started to really find that I was curious about money, how it worked, how to create more. So my journey really started on um, when I became a financial planner, a CFP. And as I started working with clients, especially clients in the retirement age, I started to notice that there was a common thread while difference amongst many, like while there's lots of differences, there was a common um, thread that I noticed that people worked really hard, which is great. They saved and they get to this golden years, as we call it, retirement. And they would retire. And it was almost like they were so excited to get there. And then they're like, oh, this is it. I have to fill my days now. Um, it seemed like they were lacking the meaning that work brought, the social bonds that work brought, where we see there's a lot of value to work. And I was curious what was happening here is we work our entire lives for this moment, but yet not, and I'm not speaking for all, but at times it seemed like it wasn't as satisfying as it once was. So I, at that point, I started to notice there was also things in me that I started to reflect back on is university was really fun for me. I had no money to my name, but it was really fun. I started making more money. I started uh, having careers that required me to work long hours. And while I was making more money, I, I reflected back and I was like, you know what, those university days, days were fun. And it started getting me to think about, is there something more than the numbers? And then I decided to kind of do what I've heard people call is me search. So research on myself is I, I started to dive into my own money story. And that brought me to this wonderful field of financial psychology that has helped me see that there is logical reasoning why we think do with our money. And for most of us, it's unconscious. And so that brought me to the certified uh, behavioral specialist designation that really looks at the psychology of money and behavioral finances. And that's now fascinated me because I, I want to help myself and others make uh, meaningful and sustainable long-term financial changes. And when we look at the root cause of our behavior changes, it, it points towards psychology. So it made sense for me to dive into the psychology of money. So we have a lot to talk about, and the, maybe where we should start is, why is understanding the psychology behind money so important? So the psychology of money first, which we also uh, hear in the academic world is financial psychology, but it's the scientific research that studies why people do the things they do. And when we look at money, it's why people do the things they do with money or put a very simple way, it explains why you think, feel, and do what you do with money. So I'm going to repeat that intentionally. So to answer your question, why is it important? Because it helps us uncover why we think, feel, and do what we do with money. And for me, that's really important when, again, we're looking for long-term financial behavior change. So we can find a lot of these you know, financial personality tests or quizzes that we can take. And you, you can find them from the big banks and, and financial institutions and things like that. And there's different wording when it comes to these different definitions of, a, of financial personality. But the, the main focus of the quiz really will come down to 
are you a saver or are you a spender? Um, and Sean, you, you, you wrote about how we individually think and feel about spending and saving comes down to financial psychology and how we interact with money is often determined by the unconscious beliefs that we hold about it. So can you talk a little bit about the different social, emotional, and cultural influences that, that have such an effect on our financial decisions? Yeah, you know, Shannon, the interesting thing is you, me, and everyone else listening today, we are all, we are all in a way actors and actresses in our own money stories that are based on these unconscious beliefs that were written for us by the things you outlined, social, emotional, and cultural influences. And these scripts have been proven by research. Dr. Brad Klontz has done fascinating research that has shown that these money scripts highly impact our thoughts, feelings, and beliefs about money. And as we're talking about here, the interesting part is, is these scripts have been written for us generations ago, not just from my parents or your parents, but our great grandparents, our long ago ancestors. We all, they all had a hand in writing these scripts, including like we've talked about, our cultural influences have a hand in writing these scripts because our cultural norms shape how we think about the world or worldview, which influences how we see the role of money in our lives. So when we tell someone, oh, you need to stop spending because you're a spender or you're a saver, we, we, we have to just recognize that, A, when we label someone as a spender or a saver, like from a psychological perspective, that now puts someone in a mental frame of, oh, I'm a spender, I'm a saver. And if it's I'm a spender, now we associate shame. I'm bad for that. But like I said, when we start to explore the psychology of money, we start to see that it makes perfect sense when we take the time to explore someone's past. It, like, let's say they are a spender. It make, we could probably find a very logical reason why they're a spender. And there's some sort of comfort to just acknowledge that with a huge dose of empathy and curiosity to be like, oh, that's why I'm doing it. When I, when I was a kid, my parents tried to keep up with the neighbors and were always spending and spending because it was a social status for them. So that's, again, a little example of why these scripts are so influential or interesting to me. And the last thing I'll just say is going back to the research, it is conclusive that when we start to explore these money scripts, we can see some huge correlations that predict our levels of income, how we use credit, um, our, our, what types of jobs we take or we select, and our financial behaviors. So there's a lot of value in taking the time to recognize our money scripts. And you also talk about there are quite a few sort of behavioral factors that can impact our, our financial lives, it, even when we're not even conscious of them. So what are some of the behavioral factors that we should be aware of? Yeah, so this is, I just want to make a quick little distinction too. So what we were talking about really is rooted in psychology, why we think, feel, and do what we do. And now we're going to what the field calls behavioral finance, what looks at what are the cognitive biases that we have that we apply to money. A cognitive bias is a mental shortcut that humans started creating over the years as we evolved um, because we didn't have time to think all the time and critically analyze things. So we just make a quick decision. While those were really important when saber tooth tigers were chasing us and we didn't have to sit and think, am I faster? Can I hide? We just go. And so, um, and that, that's a, a loss aversion is one of them. It, it, we don't want to lose. So our mental shortcuts are programmed to just make us react in that way. Now, like I said, while those helped us evolve, they don't necessarily help us with our financial health. So a few that I'd like to talk about is one is confirmation bias. I think when I explain this, a lot of people are going to be like, oh, okay, I see a little bit of myself in there. But it's this idea that I know I'm right, and I'll prove it to you. So confirmation bias occurs when we seek out information that confirms our existing beliefs, ignoring all the evidence that might challenge it. And this can lead to self-fulfilling prophecies, and it hinders our growth and our ability to see the other side. So to avoid confirmation bias, it's important that we understand that this is happening that our brain naturally tries to confirm it. So we need to seek out information that challenges those perspectives so that we can make an informed and really try to make an objective decision. 
Another one that um, really, really impacts our financial decision making is loss aversion. So loss aversion is this idea that people are motivated to avoid losing something. Um, we're more motivated to avoid losing something than to gain, gain something. And this can lead to poor financial decisions, such as holding on to investments that are losing instead of accepting the loss. People usually think like, oh, I got to ride out this loss. But if it was a poor investing decision from the get-go and you wouldn't make it today, it might be a good decision to get out of that investment, but our minds don't want to do that. And then there's also this idea called a sunk loss fallacy, which, oh, I've got to regain my loss. But again, if I wouldn't make that decision today, maybe I shouldn't be in it right now and selling or getting out is a good thing. And now I'm not giving advice individually here because so many nuances go into this. This is just on a whole. And the last one I'll say is just overconfidence bias. This one also really impacts people. So this is the bias that has the tendency to have us overestimate our own abilities and our level of control in a given situation. So we make overconfidence decisions such as investing in high assets like cryptocurrency. And in 2020, it was a good example when spe specifically Bitcoin was really, really increasing People were doing their research. They were confer com confirming their bias by looking at blogs that people thought similar to them. They thought that they were really understanding, and maybe they were, but Bitcoin really went up in 2020. And I heard a lot of people saying, hey, I figured out how to invest in cryptocurrency. I figured Bitcoin out. I'm really good. And then when it started going down, we start to find extreme external reasons why. It's not us, it's the external reasons. So those are just a few of the behavioral biases that really impact our financial decision-making. So before we head into a break here, uh, we, we talked about the social, emotional, cultural, behavioral factors that can affect our financial decisions. Have you seen any kind of differences when it comes to different demographics for age and gender and things like that? Yeah, I mean, all of them impact it. Because gender, age, race, ethnicity, all of these impact a relationship with money, which impact our financial decision making. So for example, studies have found that gender, when we look at gender, uh, women are more often risk adverse. So they have avoid more than men. And then and actually, they tend to save more, while men are often more likely to risk in, or invest in risky investments and tend to be more confident in their decision making. So they really fall susceptible to the overconfidence bias. And I, I'm speaking broadly here, not, of course, if someone's listening, they might be like, no, no, that's not me. This is what the research, which is the average. Uh, also, women tend to have a longer perspective when it comes to financial planning and more likely to seek advice from a professional. And that could that could show us that that overconfidence bias in males might be blinding us uh, from actually getting that objective view from a financial planner. Well, it's definitely a, a, a time where people are feeling overwhelmed with their finances. And so starting to understand our own personal money psychology, I think, is going to be really important leading into this year with 2023 with you know, increasing interest rates and the possible recession and, and things that are forthcoming. So if we if we really want to make some meaningful changes with our money behaviors, I think I think a good place to start is to understanding our own personal money psychology. So when Money Matters returns, Sean is going to give us some great advice. We'll be right back. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. When it comes to drugs, how much freedom is too much for kids? Drugs are out there. Will my teen feel free to say no around other kids? I didn't live drug-free when I was younger. Can I admit that to my kids? Drugs worry me. But how can I feel free to talk about it with my kids? Questions about drugs and kids? Drug-Free Kids Canada. Welcome back to Money Matters with Shannon Jackson. Today's focus is financial psychology. 
and my guest is an expert on the topic. Sean Maslick is a certified financial planner, certified financial behavior specialist, finance writer, and the host of the popular Most Hated F Word podcast. Now, before the break, we were talking about how we can educate ourselves about money and finances because access really to that type of information it is endless. We, we have, there's books and resources and things that we can tap into. And as Sean had pointed out, we need to be fully aware of how we think, feel, and behave when it comes to money, uh, because many are going to continue to struggle with improving their financial well-being if we don't understand these concepts. So that's what I want to focus on in this next segment is how our viewers can make meaningful changes to their money behaviors and why the best place for them to start is understanding their own financial psychology. Now, Sean, I have two quotes from your article. Now, the first one is, to reduce stress around money, it's important to be aware of your instinctual behaviors and try to control them. And the second quote is, it's time to evolve the thinking around money and embrace your own psychology of money so we can bring awareness as to why we think, feel, and behave the way we do with money. So Sean, what is your advice to those who are watching right now? How do they become more aware of their instinctual behaviors? What we're starting to see, is, and when I say it's time to evolve the way we're, um, we think around money, is normally when we feel like I need to, a word we often say, do better with money, we rely on those external information, which at times is really critical. Like financial literacy is very, very important. Um, podcasts, like you said, I have a podcast. These are important sources of information. However, what we're starting to see is if we have these psychological barriers that are keeping us stuck, that are keeping us in this reactive, at times, um, this story around money that's unconsciously playing in our minds, then it is hard to make these long-term meaningful or behavior changes. And what I mean by that is uh, we all know eating better in the gym, classic examples people give around um, behavior change all the time. But we know how to be better eaters. We know how to go to the gym. It's one of the most lucrative businesses is the wellness space in terms of um, diets and et cetera. But yet we fail to make these changes. And money is no different because it requires us to change deeply rooted uh, instinctual decisions that have been happening for years and years and years. And we've been talking about these have been habitualized into us since we were like two to five years old, we started thinking and feeling around money without even aware, being aware of it. So something that I'm a big advocate on is slowing down and just sitting with the discomfort that comes along with, hey, I need to make a, I need to do better in my money. To sit with, what, what does that mean? And someone might say, I need to save more. But what, what does that mean? What does it feel like to save? What does it feel like when you're not saving? And what we like to do is tap into the emotional side of it. Um, people have said to me when I was doing my CFP, is like, take the emotions out of investing. And it's interesting, from a science perspective, that's actually lit literally impossible. Like, I cannot take emotions out of me. I'm a human being. I understand what they're trying to say is like, make an objective, informed view. So... I think, and this is backed by a lots of research now, is the value of reflection, um, sitting with those feelings of why can't I make that save or why can't I start saving is really going to help us bring awareness to, again, like I've talked about, why we think, feel, and behave with money. So one example I'd like to give is called the money log. Um, I've quote, I talked about Dr. Brad Klons already on here. This is an exercise that he adapted from clinical psychology to our financial world that really, really helps. I've done this with several, several, several people, and, and it really helps slow us down, notice the reactivity that we might have, and helps us identify, ah, that's what I'm doing. That's why I feel like this. That's why I feel like I got to go buy on Amazon, et cetera. So the money log... It helps us increase our awareness of these reactive automatic thoughts and patterns. And since our money scripts, what I talked about earlier, these, these scripts that are, have been given to us and how we think, behave, and uh, deal with money, they often lie outside of our zone of consciousness. So we're not aware of these automatic reactive decisions around money. So the money log can help us go on this kind of guided discovery to practice how we can increase our awareness of these automatic thoughts. So the money log has four relatively simple, but 
I'm going to say difficult steps in the, and I say difficult because it requires us just to take a breath, surrender to the idea that this might seem a simple exercise, but it could be super profound. So the first step is to identify a triggering event situation or an emotion that prompt the financial behavior. Number two is to identify the thoughts or money scripts that follow the trigger. And number three is to identify the impulse or action that followed the money script. And then four is identify the actual behavior or decision that resulted from the trigger of the money script or impulse. So for example, it could be work is super stressful. I worked all night. I realized that this is actually the whole week of doing this. So my triggering event is I just had enough of work. I've been working too much. Um, the emotion is, is fatigue maybe or depleted. So number two is identifying the thoughts or money scripts. The thought is I deserve better. I deserve my family deserves uh, some benefits from me working so hard by me or the benefit. Sorry. My family deserves some, a holiday. I'm in Mexico right now. My family deserves a holiday. Uh, I'm going to go on the holiday because I've been working so hard. Identify number three is identify the impulse or action is I don't even think about it. I just book the nicest hotel because I feel bad. I feel guilty. I'm actually unaware that I'm fearful that my kids might not think I'm present with them. And this is all happening unconsciously. So I booked that hotel because that's going to make everything better. That's what's going on in my head. And four is identifying the actual behavior or decision that result in the trigger. So in this case, I booked a very reactive, impulsive trip that was based probably around fear that I didn't think I was being a good father. And this might sound a little uh, harsh, but these are things that are actually going on. And, you know, that first came to my mind because that's a, that's a, that's a story that I've had in my life. life. So the money log then allows us time to write down our thoughts, what's actually happening. And that was a real one for me is I realized fear was driving me to make decisions that I didn't like. And the money log certainly helped me. I, I agree with you in that our, our thoughts behind our money decisions, they're, they seem so ingrained. Um, and I, I, I like the idea of stopping, taking a breath, um, consciously asking ourselves these questions to uh, better understand why we're making these choices. So um, I think that's that's really good information. And I and really, there's no better time than now to start to become more aware of our own money psychology. Um, so many Canadians, um, especially here in Ontario, they're we're all feeling financially stressed. High inflation, rising interest rates, the coming recession, and and there seems to be a sort of a, nev a never ending list of money struggles. So, Sean, can you can you talk a little bit about the benefits of understanding our own money psychology and how that understanding will help when it comes to making decisions uh, coming up in the future? Yeah, you know what, understanding our own psychology of money, our own money stories, kind of a, uh, an easier way to do it, helps us remove these emotional barriers that have kept us stuck. And what I mean by that is when we can notice, like my example that I walked through, when I can notice fear is a big part of, say, my money story, which it was and still is, then I can start to realize that, wait, is this a fear-based decision? And just the acknowledgement of it kind of makes it accepting that, okay, yeah, that's actually true. I'm not weak. I'm just human. I have emotions. So people often struggle with emotional barriers that impede their decision-making around money. And common examples are fear, anxiety, um, also procrastination when it comes to managing their finances, which prevents us from making, I would say, maybe the, the most desired financial decision. So what I really find out of all this work is that we can really start to identify how we can slow that reaction down and so that we can remove ourselves and come get out of the stagnant money story that we're in. And just a quick example. So for me, I was a shy kid growing up and I went into finance. It was a kind of a high, like people looked at money, people, we still do. People look at money roles as like, oh, good for you. So I started getting promotions and jobs. People were like, good job, Sean. And for a shy kid, 
who didn't have a voice and felt like people didn't recognize me, that felt good. So I attached the meaning I unconsciously attached to money was power, prestige, control, things that a shy kid didn't feel like he had. And so I was relentlessly trying to continue to chase that because it made me feel good for a moment. And it wasn't until I started to really dive into this work that I realized like, whoa, while those moments feel good, they're fleeting, but my kids are on the floor playing right now and I'm justifying working all night so that I could retire at 65 to be with them. They're right there right now. So I need to just shut my computer. And so that's the power that this, all of this has is that we could start to come become ourselves, move towards becoming a human being instead of a human doer that I was really good at. And I still have trouble balancing the two. I think it's, it's so important to be more self-aware. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that can be really challenging when, when we have to look internally about our uh, emotions or, or the decisions that we're making and what's behind those decisions, it, it, it can be uncomfortable. Um, but I think, as you're saying, it's very important to, to do that, to sort of understand where you're going from here. So as we consider um, what's coming up sort of this coming year, do you think that uh, there's anything that viewers should be um, paying attention to or should be focusing on with the economic uncertainty that's happening now? With the uncertain economics uh, outcome or forecasts, inflation, like you talked about, interest rates, to realize that our emotions and money are like the unavoidable dynamic duel that are so intertwined that those fear all these negative, uh, when I say negative, emotions aren't negative at all. These um, un, unseen emotions can cause negative reactions. Um, just to be aware that the more stress that we have, the more from the external world, the more stress that's going to be happening internally, that it'll be more difficult to actually sit with those um, understanding what we're all talking about. But yet, it, it's going to be an important thing to take on in 2023 is how can we start to separate, if at all, our emotions and money so that we're not super reactive um, and, and harming our financial health. Well, that's all really great information. Uh, with the short amount of time that we have left, do you have any final advice for our viewers? Our money stories is a work in progress. We never arrive. It's always something that we're aspiring towards. We never get it right, so to speak. But as we start to embark on this journey to realize that maybe there are things more than the numbers, more than my bank account. There's this peaceful practice of surrender that comes along with recognizing that, holy smokes, I didn't get it right and that's okay. Well, I really wanna thank you for joining us today on Money Matters. And I also wanna thank our viewers for tuning in. So until next time, I'm Shannon Jackson. the Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media. We can be hurt. We can be bruised. We can be broken. 